Live from downtown Detroit, Local 4 News at 6 starts now. Some problematic weather is arriving in Metro Detroit. Some areas already seeing freezing rain as we also prepare for some snowfall. Thanks everybody for joining us here at 6. I'm Karen Drew in for Kimberly Gill tonight. I'm Devin Skillian. Drivers uh, may be dealing with all kinds of things depending on where you are. Let's start things off here at 6 with Kim Adams and Forewarn Weather. Kim. Well, we have everything from completely dry conditions in downtown Detroit to freezing drizzle in Oakland County, all the way to freezing rain and sleet over in Lansing. But let's talk about right now what's going on in Ann Arbor because we have a pocket of some fairly heavy freezing rain falling right along I-94, but it's dry as you go into Novi and Northville. Then in Lansing, more freezing rain there as well. We see temperatures well below freezing in many spots, so this rain is freezing on contact. Coming up, we'll talk more about road conditions and what you can expect for the next 24 hours in the forecast. If you want the radar in the palm of your hand, the best way to do it, though, is to right now go to your favorite app store, type in WDIV, click on the forewarn weather app and download it. Then you can have what's going on in your neighborhood right in the palm of your hand. All right, Kim, now we move to the latest on the MSU campus shooting that killed three students Monday and wounded five others. A positive update from Sparrow Hospital tonight where one of those students has been upgraded to stable condition. Four others, though, do remain in critical condition at this hour. Uh, the state news, uh, the MSU's student-run newspaper today published an emotional editorial titled, We're Not Going to Class Monday. It details the reasons they don't feel ready to resume their studies after the series of events on Monday night. You can read excerpts of that at clickondetroit.com or the entire thing at statenews.com. Classes, by the way, though, are still set to resume on Monday. We've also learned the Michigan State and Michigan men's basketball game is going to be played as scheduled. That's set for Saturday at 8 p.m., and that's in Ann Arbor. Here in Detroit this evening, people gathered at Wayne State University for a vigil showing their support for MSU to pray for those five in the hospital and remember the three lives lost. Well, our focus remains on the victims and everyone affected at MSU. We are also learning more about the investigation of the shooter and exactly what happened Monday night. Sean Lay working that story has the very latest from East Lansing. Good evening from the campus of Michigan State University, learning much more today about the gunman, about the gunman, the loner, and how he was able to walk off campus for hours undetected. How did the gunman Anthony McRae walk into Berkey Hall, shoot MSU students, walk down to the student union to continue his shooting rampage, and with police swarming, how did McRae walk away and almost make it to his father's home five miles away? Due to the number of reports that we were receiving on campus, um, we actually at the time thought that he was still on campus. I mean, we had no indication at the time that he left campus. We confirmed that McRae was found with two handguns after he took his own life as police closed in on him that night. In a wide-ranging update today from police, they confirmed the handguns were legally purchased by McRae, helped when an Ingham County prosecutor allowed McRae to plead down a felony gun charge in 2019 to a misdemeanor. McRae's father told investigators his son moved in with him in Lansing after his mother died in 2020 and became angry and evil. After the shooting Monday, police found a note on McRae where he wrote that he was the leader of 20 additional gunmen. But police did not believe that, saying the father quickly told them McRae knew essentially no one. We brought that up to him, and he had mentioned that his son does not have any friends. He pretty much sat in his room most of the time. He ate, uh, went to the bathroom in there. So he, he pretty much never left his room and his father didn't believe that he had any friends, let alone 20 of them. At the time, we had to make a decision whether we believe that the, the statement about there being 20 people involved was credible based on the information that we had at the time. And I stand by that and we continue to stand by that. We do not believe that to be accurate. And that's why we did what we did. All right, back here live. Imagine what was happening there. So you have the shooting at MSU and trying to help everyone there uh, and trying to find the gunman. And then three, three and a half miles away, you have this guy who shoots himself and they find a note saying he's with 20 others. But police say they did not believe it at that time. They got that note out and pictures of the note to all the first responders there. And they made the call that they believe there was no more shooters, active shooters on that campus. What else did we learn, uh, Kevin, uh, uh, Devin and Karen? that he had two handguns, both purchased legally, not registered, and also in that wallet was a 
kind of a hit list of other locations, a church, his former employer, a Meyer distribution center warehouse, uh, a fast food place and a discount store where he may have been slighted in those places, asked to leave. And there was on his list also saying that he was going to shoot up MSU on that list. Back to you. So Sean, have you been able to find out what that list that he had? Was he actually leaving campus to continue on with those other potential targets? We asked that how, how terrifying, but police believe uh, investigators believe he was walking right back to his father's and he was almost there. Uh, so he was not continuing on at that point. Had he gotten back in that little house with his dad? Would they have found him? How how long would it take to track him down? You know, did they and would he, would he have continue on the next day? Uh, those are questions we're going to continue to ask. And we put all the, the entire one hour news conference, Karen, on our website. Click on the Detroit.com. It's worth watching. We asked the questions and investigators answered them as best they could at this point, helping us kind of piece together exactly what's happened here this week. We appreciate your work today. Thank you very much, Sean. Other news tonight, Carl's Cabin, known far and wide around the Ann Arbor area. The Salem Township restaurant's been around for nearly 100 years. Well, there was a fire last night while the restaurant was open, sending customers and staff scrambling for safety. But our Rob Maloney shows us the owners are already planning their comeback. We're inside Carl's Kitchen and they had a full house here last night. And of course, firefighters will tell you they want people to just get up and go if there's a fire. And as you can tell by the dinners that have been left behind, that that's exactly what happened. People leaving their food behind 24 hours ago. Turns out there were volunteer firefighters in the restaurant as well. They went right to work. This video shot by a passerby shows wind aided flames took off quickly. Co-owner Peter Palos is grateful. That was very, very important. It was a busy night uh, with, you know, lots of people in the restaurant and, um, you know, they did a great job of just getting everyone together and moving them outside. A quick response by a dozen fire departments too helped a lot, says Salem Township Fire Chief James Rockwell. Because we're a rural area and every drop of water we come to fight this fire with, we have to truck in and we went to our first alarm. It's looking like a carelessly disposed of cigarette outside the back entrance started the fire next to a number of propane tanks. Still, firefighters kept the fire contained to a small back area, the bar, kitchen and dining room are intact. There is a lot of smoke damage. Still, considering there is layer upon layer of varnish on the old cabin logs, co-owner Louis Palos calls it a miracle. The whole place didn't burn. We're also just uh, concerned for our staff. Uh, this sort of situation is means we're going to have to be closed for a little while and, and they're going to have to figure something out. We might be the owners, but I th there's, you know, it's, our staff is fully invested in this and quite honestly, so are our customers. I mean, you know, we have the best clientele in the, in, in the state. We love them and, you know, we'll get it back open again. Carl's is across the street from Gottfordson Road here, and there's a big farm field where they're going to be building a new housing development. And as part of the development, they put in fire hydrants. Only problem is they're not connected. Had they been, it's likely there would have been less damage. In Salem Township, Rod Maloney, Local 4. Busted at the border, the U.S. Customs and Border Protection Office is giving us an inside look at its enforcement operations for the past year. Our Jacqueline Francis is live tonight with what they found. Jacqueline. Yeah, fentanyl, cocaine and methamphetamine. Those are just a few of the drugs seized at the border this past year, not to mention the guns, ammunition and counterfeit items also confiscated. Drugs, guns, and ammunition. These are just some of the items seized at the U.S. Canadian border last year. The U.S. Customs and Border Protection Detroit office giving a rundown of what they say was a busier than usual year coming out of the pandemic. The agency reporting an increase in the smuggling of two drugs in particular. We seized over a thousand pounds of cocaine, which was a 320 percent increase from the previous year. 543 pounds of methamphetamine, which was a 2,000% increase over 2021. They make these finds using highly trained professionals, along with technology and other resources. It could be canines, you know, dogs. It could be uh, very advanced x-ray you know, systems in addition to highly sophisticated computer systems that we have. Confiscating counterfeit items is also a priority. And here's why. You know, these counterfeit commodities are often used by criminal enterprises to support criminal activities, terrorism. So by us enforcing those intellectual property rights laws, we're keeping the country safe from things like terrorism and you know, drug smuggling and you know, criminality. 
The U.S. Customs and Border Protection Office is proud of its work, committed to the safety of the state and nation. We'd like everyone to know that CBP is uh, you know, on the job every day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, trying to protect you know, our nation. So back here live, we're here by the checkpoint next to the Ambassador Bridge. So it's not too far down that way. That construction is underway for the Gordy Howe International Bridge, set to open sometime next year. Officials here tell me they're already working on ramping up staffing, so they're ready for that big grand opening. Reporting live tonight, Jacqueline Francis, Local 4.